And hello, Joe. How are you? I am well. It's a beautiful spring day. How about you? It is a nice day. I'm doing good. Yeah, thank you. Where are you located at? Uh, we're right outside of Washington, D.C., so okay, uh, suburban Maryland. Nice. Right on. Yeah, I'm in uh, in Long Beach here by L.A., and it's it's oh. a little chilly for us, but not bad. Oh, well, we're in the 70s now, which is like... <laughs> <laughs> Life's good, huh? Yeah, life is good. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, this is a you cover some interesting stuff, like I, things that a lot of people think about. But uh, I mean, is it's you know very detailed and and there's a, a lot to it. I think. Yeah, yeah. I my the tagline I usually use is I, I think deep thoughts about shallow things because it's something that <laughs> everybody's thinking about. It's kind of out there, and they think it's ordinary and it's traditional, it's normal or whatever. And I'm sitting there saying, "Ah, oh, it's so complicated." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just so many things that influence it and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess you. This is from your your website. I, I'm quoting you here. It says you're an independent scholar specializing in the history of dress in America. So what does that mean exactly? Okay, the independent scholar type, that means that I am no longer employed. I'm, <laughs> I'm retired. Yes, yeah. I'm independent. So now, right now I can do anything I want. Uh, I'm retired from the University of Maryland uh, after 41 years of teaching and researching and doing that sort of thing. And now I'm just doing the researching and writing. And uh, this is the teaching that I do is doing interviews and interacting with people and stuff like that so and the dress in america that's kind of the big umbrella where i fit like when i hang out with my fellow wizards i'm hanging out with other people who study the history of fashion the history of dress people who design theater costumes people who are into current fashion people who are into reenactment so anybody who is interested in clothing and the why of clothing and the how oh okay yeah Interesting. Very cool. Um, so, I mean, does that like, does that include even stuff with maybe like, uh, like plays or films or anything with helping that kind of stuff or no? I wish I did more of that. I have friends who do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, and I, I long ago aspired to do that. That was what I first thought that one could do with what I had a lifelong interest in the way people dressed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first started, I majored in um, clothing design as an undergraduate, and I thought, well, I'll work in theater. And I tried that a little bit, and um, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> mm. uh, I'm a, a good researcher and a bad designer. So I, <laughs> so I stuck with the research. Right. Well, that's fine. I mean, you yeah. tried it, and you, you found your niche, and you know what you're exactly. good at. Exactly. And I still enjoy a good play and a good movie, so it's it's all good. There you go. It all you just don't. Want, you just don't want to go to a movie with me where there's a lot of historic costumes because I'm that person who will sit there and say, oh, "That's terrible. That's wrong." <laughs> so. uh, yes, that's good. I kind of like that. I I like when people are able to do that because I can oh, yeah. you know sit and enjoy the movie, but then I like to know what's wrong with it and what what they got wrong, especially with historical events and stuff like that too. So yeah, that'd be fun. I'd be down to go with the movie with you. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> Cool. So, I mean, yeah, let's, I'm just very curious to learn about, you know, all the stuff that you've been studying. So like, how does this, where does it all begin? Like the, where, yeah. where do your studies kind of start or okay, the, the little, the little slice that I do in that vast realm of, of clothing and considering everybody wears clothing and people have been wearing clothing for millennia. That's a lot of material. Okay. I pretty much, uh, people contact me if they're interested in clothing and gender. You know, especially in uh, American and European costume. I'm not so good at clothing and gender outside of those boundaries. And I pretty much am good at, um, I have friends who do genealogy and they find old ancestor pictures and they'll show me a picture and say, when do you think this is? And I'm pretty good at that from about 1860 on. <laughs> oh, that's cool. It's, it's, it's a parlor trick. You know, it's one of these things where yeah. they'll show me and they say, I don't know if this is my great-grandmother or my great-great-grandmother, which one is it? And they'll give me the dates and I'll say, well, it's probably your great-great-grandmother because of what she's wearing. Wow. So, yeah. Very, very cool. So yeah, that's, that's... that's kind of so briefly. It's I'm, I'm a North American costume, especially clothing and gender since the middle of the 19th century. 
focus and study, huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. such as it is. It doesn't sound right. very focused when I when I think of it. But. That's a lot, yeah. But okay, cool. So I mean, I yeah. guess yeah. The way I found you was through your um, book, Pink and Blue, um, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. on Amazon. Everything I'll have links to all that stuff so people can check it out. Um, haven't got a chance to read it yet, but it sounds super interesting because it's basically, I mean, the main question is how, why do girls wear pink and boys wear blue? Yeah, that's that's like one chapter. It, it, oh. <laughs> Because it's the the subtitle of the book is telling the boys and the girls in America, okay. And so it's how <clears throat> babies stopped wearing dresses because it used to be that all babies wore white dresses. So how do white dresses go for something that all babies wear to only girl babies would wear, or only boy babies can wear at a christening if it's a traditional gown or something? But you know, dresses are for girls. So there's a whole chapter that's like dresses and what happened with dresses. Mm-hmm. There's another whole chapter on how did girls start wearing pants because there was a time when only men wore pants. And even little boys didn't wear pants because they weren't men yet. So oh. babies wore dresses. Little boys wore uh, either dresses or short pants. And then when you hit 12 or 13 years old, then you've got long pants. So okay. when does it... So the, that's a whole chapter there of how how pants become first okay for little boys and then okay for everybody under certain circumstances. And then there's a whole chapter on pink and blue. So, yeah, because as I said, it's it seems like something that is like it's everywhere. It's commonplace. But once you get into it, it's really complicated because all those changes didn't happen at the same time. Like there's there's the pink and blue story happens kind of along one timeline and then the let's put little boys in pants and let's put little boys in pants earlier. Let's put little boy babies in pants and that's okay, which would not have been okay 150 years ago. So there's that story and that happens along a different timeline. And then there's the long hair for little boys, which is okay at one point, but then not okay. So that happens. So it all happens along different timelines, but as far as, people today are concerned it's like no boys have short hair they wear pants and do not wear dresses they do not wear pink they do not have lace on their clothing or flowers or probably not cats unless they're tigers or lions you know there are all these rules all these gender rules that we play by and they all kind of slide in to the picture at different points so that's what the book is about is exactly when and all this happened and then trying to speculate on how and why. Okay. I see. Why, why do people care and why do, how does it reveal what we think about gender, what we think about sexuality, what we think about babies, Mm -hmm. whether or not babies have gender or sex. Right. All that good stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, Cause I'll, I'll kind of come across this, you know, pretty often because I'm a, I make a balloon animals and, and hats and everything like that at yeah. downtown Disney here in, in Anaheim. And, you know, I have a different list for, for boys and girls because they each, you know, like they're I, different stuff, I, you know. I want to see your list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for girls, it's like Minnie Mouse, unicorn, butterfly, stuff like that. And then for boys, it's generally like Spider Man, dinosaur. Mickey Mouse, stuff like that, you know? You're going to make me cry. <laughs> what happens if a little boy says, well, I want a butterfly? Oh, well, I'll totally make the butterfly. Okay. But do you ever course, get the, yeah. the, the adults kind of trying to edit that? Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. yeah. The the dad will not want the boy to get the butterfly or anything. But usually I'll just I'll just kind of ignore the, the parent at that point and just talk to the kid and just get him what he wants. But, yeah, it's just uh, – yeah, that's just the way – it is. It's it's weird that it's that's the way it is, you know. But like, why is it that way? Why have we all kind of agreed upon these rules? And there you have it in a nutshell. That's my entire career. So weird. It's just the way it is. But it's kind of weird the way it is. So why are we doing this? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's very true. Like the way, like what you said. Like girls can do cats, but boys can only do cats if it's a lion or something like that. Like it's so weird. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's, it's something, yeah, I I definitely do see it all the time. And, you know, I'll ask what color, you know, a cat, some, a a kid wants and the girl, you know, 80% of the time says pink and the boy 80% of the time says blue. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, I definitely see, you know, where this is coming from. So can we kind of like dig into one of these? Like, can we dig into the sure. the, the pink and blue thing and, and yeah, how this all got started? Yeah, we can really start digging anywhere you want. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about the the white dresses too, because I, you know, I've maybe seen photos of kids sure. in white dresses and stuff, but never, yeah. you know, that's I've never really thought of that, and I don't, you don't really see that much anymore today. No, no, it's that's pretty much gone completely out, even for little girls. Mm -hmm. uh, but it used to be that was baby clothes. I mean, the way parents today would put little kids in a onesie, you know, it was a one piece thing. You had lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it used to be that if you were going to have a baby, you had like stacks and stacks and stacks of these little white cotton dresses. Mm -hmm. um, they're, the main reason for it was because back in the day, uh, white cotton, it's washable. You don't want to use any kind of colors because colors weren't that fast. And in order to really clean clothes like a, a baby dress, you'd boil it which would fade the colors and make them run. So white cotton makes the most sense mm -hmm. um, for changing diapers and that sort of thing. A dress makes a whole lot more sense than anything with legs. Yeah, good point. It does. It is. It's a, I mean, the, the equivalent today and what I see parents do today, they don't wear dresses, but they'll have the kid running around in a T-shirt and diapers. Well, mm -hmm. a T-shirt on a baby is just a dress. But, True. They, but you know, think of it that way. It's okay. It gets, it's a shirt. You called it a dress. There might be people who'd be freaking out, but it's the same, functionally the same as a dress for diaper changing, right? Yeah. So the, the dress is replaced initially by uh, shorter gowns and things like that and just tops. And now it's just t shirts. I see. So, um, but yeah, there was no difference between a dress for a boy baby and a dress for a girl baby. A baby was a baby. It's yeah. very, very normal in the when people are writing about babies in the late 19th, early 20th century, whether you're talking about advice books or columns and magazines or people writing about their own baby, to refer to a baby as it. Oh, okay. When they're when they're little, little babies. Because the 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 main thing that I realized can't say I discovered it because it was there and I just realized it was that um, there was a real aversion to looking at a baby and seeing gender because the idea that a baby had gender meant that they were in some way really masculine, really feminine, which to people back then was more of an adult thing. So gender okay. and sex are very closely tied and you didn't start dressing a little boy differently from a little girl or a little girl differently from a little boy either way you didn't start you dress them as babies at first when all they are is babies and then the more they become oh. like little boys and little girls then you change the clothing to match their development i see okay because if you do that too early children will notice the difference they'll become curious about it and that's bad right so so you don't want children to be aware of gender or start asking uncomfortable questions about sex when they're too young. So say around eight, the 1890s, it was very common. Most, most little boys would have worn dresses or skirts. They went from a one-piece thing to maybe a two-page thing until around mm -hmm. the time they started school when they were five or six years old. Oh, when, they, okay. when they went off to school, then they'd get their first haircut and their first pair of short pants. Because, again, they're short. not men yet, so they don't get long pants. Right. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So it all just started off, it was all just for practical reasons, really. And then there was just, so this thing of not wanting to kind of let the child know about gender and stuff, really, or identify with that, was that more, do you think, for the child's benefit or just because like the adults in society mm -hmm. didn't want to they yeah. didn't want to talk about it and stuff yeah it's probably a mix of the two but they, they certainly if you'd ask them they would have been for the child's benefit that they really thought that it was a bad thing for children to be too aware of this too soon uh they thought that one of the things that led to i'm trying to think of the word they used well it's precociousness or sexual depravity of any kind and that included uh homosexuality or masturbation or anything you want to mention all these things were 
the cause of that was children being too aware of sex too early. That you try to okay. keep them innocent and not know about sex until they, they got older and you could actually explain it to them. But for okay. a three-year-old to know that boys and girls were somehow different, that was a bad thing. Next thing okay. you know, they go look at them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was kind of a way for them to kind yeah. of like put their values and stuff, I guess, or, or kind of yeah. avoid it at the time for, yeah. for young sure. children. Yeah, as parents always do. And right. the, what, what changes, which is probably your next question, um, what changes is you have the the introduction of psychology, specifically child psychology. Who start they start saying, well, no, we think what causes, for example, homosexuality is people is boys attaching themselves too much to their mothers, and think and and wanting to emulate the mother. So we need to get them to start realizing they're boys and emulating the father sooner. Oh, ah, okay. so now you see what happens. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting that it was like a real, so it, it was kind of a conscious shift by everybody mm -hmm. to do this for this outcome of, you know, of boys not becoming homosexuals or whatever. Right. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's very explicit in the child psychology literature where they'll say something like, uh, you need to make a distinction and the earlier the better. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, I had, yeah. I had just assumed it sort of, evolved i mean it totally makes sense now you think about it like <laughs> that it just changed for some reason but of course there's a, a reason that that would change like that yeah it but it doesn't change quickly and that's the thing that was interesting to me is you, you actually because you still are going to have parents who are sitting there saying but i just don't feel comfortable it doesn't look right to have this little boy wearing pants you know it's not they're for whatever reason mm -hmm. there 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 are going to be people who are the kind of progressive parents who read this literature and say oh wow that's true i need to do this and then you're going to have the laggers so in the example of pink and blue which is introduced just as a fashion thing like in the mid 19th century and it's not even consistent because sometimes you'll find what's in fashion is all kinds of pastels and you do it according to the the baby's complexion and hair and eye color so oh. a blue-eyed baby gets blue, and a brown-eyed baby gets pink. Oh. And then you have, there are different parts of Europe already that were doing some color coding by gender, but it was not consistent. So in Belgium and Switzerland, for example, in Catholic parts of Germany, it was blue for the girl, because that was the color of Virgin Mary. Okay. And in other places, it was pink for girls and blue for boys. So... If you look all the way through the 1930s, you're going to find both. You're going to find pink for girls, pink for boys. You're going to find it doesn't matter. You're going to find the color, eye color thing all over the place. Okay. So, so it takes a couple of generations to get to the point where by the time I was a little girl in the 1950s, pink was, I'd say, mostly a girl color, but not exclusively. Um, first birthday cakes, the most common color for first birthday cakes in the 1950s was pink for a boy mm -hmm. or a girl. So oh, okay. it wasn't, it wasn't so exclusively female that a boy could not have it. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen the, uh, the Disney Peter Pan, that's early fifties, the mm -hmm. littlest boy in that Michael is wearing pink pajamas. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now they re-released it a few years back and they remastered it and, you know, no. they did. Yeah, they oh did. Oh, my gosh. Did they really? <laughs> they did. He's wearing oh, my gosh. Now. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. I guess people were freaking out. <laughs> but, or or somebody, somebody at, at Disney freaked out and said, oh, you can't have that. Oh, uh, wow. So So what pink really doesn't become this kind of mandated feminine color where not only boys shouldn't wear pink, but you start seeing all this pinkification of everything for girls is pink. And you, if you're going to have a baby and you know, it's a girl, the whole nursery is pink. Not until the mid 1980s. Oh, wow. Really? Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. 1980. Okay. Well, I was born in 93, so that's my whole life, but that seems very recent. And, and, and the interesting thing is for, for anybody, 
whatever was tradition or common practice when you were a kid, it's always been that way in your mind. Right. So for me, the fact that it was kind of pink was a girl color, but it wasn't mandatory. Like I, I hardly ever wore pink. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. My mother liked me better in blue and red and stuff like that. So I, I mean, pink was just not part of my landscape. Um, and I had lots of choices. I don't think there even were pink bicycles. Oh. I think I think the choice of bicycle I had was red or blue or green. Mm -hmm. And sneakers came in white, red, and blue. Okay. Ooh, that was it. Yeah. So the idea that I walk into the clothing department and see like pinky, pink, pink, pink all over the place, that's just not part of – and I thought that was normal. Right. The, the lack of pink. And it wasn't until I had my, – my kids were born in 1982, my daughter, in mm -hmm. 1986, my son. And, of course, being the person I am studying the stuff I am, I'm sitting there going, what has gone on when I went to buy baby clothes? Yeah. All of a sudden, it wasn't the landscape that I expected. I was walking in and seeing, here's the pink section, here's the blue section. Mm -hmm. It. I just went to. I just went shopping. Well, I didn't shop really. I just looked. Um, I call it research. I went to Macy's. <laughs> I was in New York City last weekend and went to Macy's, Thirty Fourth mm -hmm. Street. Had to go look. Went up to the children's department, and the the girls section is not only pink and pastel. It is tutus. For some reason, we're doing lots and lots of nylon tutus right now, even for little, little girls. <laughs> and again, not part of my landscape yeah. ever, ever. Right. So that must be at least the, an explanation for the, the slow change of things, right? When, you know, when the, the psychology did release that, you know, we want to start you know, having boys dress yeah. as boys younger, the people that were slower to change were just like, well, that's, that's not how it was when we were young. So that's weird. Right. Right. Okay. And, and, and that's not right because they shouldn't be thinking about sex and won't this do this. I remember they told us this, like, I think it's always the problem. People think that scientific information, it just is rolled out and a, a switch goes on and people go, Whoa, you mean, <laughs> you mean we are going around the sun? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I need to change my entire mindset, yeah. but it, it doesn't work that way. So yeah, it takes a while and there are always going to be people who are early adopters and late adopters. And of course the thing that's the real kicker for someone, I mean, I actually do believe in science and for the most part, I think we need to pay attention to scientists, but it drove me crazy when I was doing this research that every generation of psychologists has come up with new information about gender. That replaces all the old information. Oh. Right? <laughs> and every time they are so sure of themselves and absolutely like, this is the way it is. And then right. somebody else comes along, does another study and says, no. But what do what does the ordinary person know? Are they aware of that entire conversation? Or do they only know what they learned in Psychology 101 their freshman year of college? <laughs> Right. Or what they just heard on the radio five years ago. Mm -hmm. So the scientific scientific knowledge in, in the larger world is very uneven, sometimes lags behind, sometimes probably decades behind. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Understandable. Um, so why, I mean, when you were talking about even in the 30s when there was – you know, boys might wear pink or, you know, it was kind of pink and blue to go with your complexion or eye color or whatever. Is there a reason that it seems to have, have been mainly pink and blue? Is that the case or were there, were, did people do like green or yellow or anything like that? Yeah, there were, some people would do green or yellow, but not, they weren't gendered. Oh, and I see. The two, the, gen, the two gender colors seem to have settled on that i don't know i mean partly it might be because they were already used as gendered colors in europe so there are people if there are people who are aware of german traditions and of course we were getting people coming over to this country from europe who are bringing those traditions with them mm -hmm. uh, so that might have been it the other thing is that it just in terms of color they are complementary so they kind of are opposite each other okay sort of. so they just look roughly. look nice together yeah, although if you were going to pick some colors for 
something as important as gender, picking something that colorblind people could see more easily might have been a better choice. Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good <laughs> point. Yeah. I didn't, what do yeah. you think of that? Yeah. You're not colorblind. I take it. No, <laughs> I no. Don't no, 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 no. So what are some colors that are better for colorblind? Well, if they picked, uh, even if they picked, um, like, well, yellow uh -huh. and either, and yellow and blue or, um, they could pick black and white. I mean, they could have picked anything to be more, uh, but especially a kind of orangey tone pink and blue mm -hmm. for somebody who's in, there's about 7% of people who are colorblind for whom pink and blue look gray. Oh, really? So, I mean, really, if you're going to pick something, I mean, look at the colors they use for traffic lights and things like that. Yeah. You, you could use more saturated colors. You could, you know, instead of the pastels and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's just, a, it's an interesting choice if you're just trying to be practical about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it must be frustrating for you to go, to, you know, to study all this stuff and then go to, you know, Macy's and see the whole pink aisle and, and the everything like that. Like, yeah, I mean, because I mean, I've literally been studying this and writing about it since my kids were little, so thirty-five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I admit, a lot of it is like academic stuff, so no one's going to read that. But then, you know, I, I was, I've given interviews, I've, I've got the book, I've got this and that, and I figured at some point somebody would say, you know, there are probably some people out there who would like some choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but I was surprised that at a big department store, there was a little, I look, just looked at the infant section and the infant section, there was this very small, obviously kind of neutral baby thing section. It was very small and very boring. Okay. It's not very fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 So is that kind of what you're, um, doing this research and learning everything, is that kind of what you're advocating for is just more choices and more yeah. neutrality and everything? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'd like to see neutrality redefined as less boring. Uh, I would like to see more choice and I'm not even talking about more choice, like in the girls section and more choice in the boys section. I'd like to see a baby section Mm -hmm. So that you actually have the full choice, the full spectrum of whatever the kid wants to wear. Uh, now, that's tough with babies because babies don't have fashion sense or d opinions. Right. But, but I think parents do need to be aware that these are not innocuous choices, too. That um, from the time, and of course, beginning in the mid-1980s, people have been able to tell before birth what their baby is, whether it's biologically male or female mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't actually tell them a whole thing about the child and yet what that does is set in motion a whole lot of con consumer decisions about the clothes they buy the toys they buy the way they decorate their room and those choices do influence a child's development both mm -hmm. in terms of establishing an environment for that child so that small wonder that the little girls that you see at, at Disneyland want a pink balloon. They, mm -hmm. Pink is all around them and right. they see it as a positive thing and this is what they're supposed to have. So this is what they want. Uh, if you could go back in time to 1952 and ask the same little, well, no, Disneyland wasn't open then. But anyway, if you could, um, Close. Yeah. they probably would ask for different colors. Pink would be among them, but not 80%, you know, because mm -hmm. it just wasn't that, it wasn't that common a color for little girls. Right. And we had lots of other choices. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So for me, when I'm going when, as a balloon twister, should I now change what I'm doing and just come up with, you know, like a, a list of five or six that I just say to everybody, no matter what, do you think that would be a, a good route to take? I don't know. You're the balloon maker, so I don't know how that would work. Uh, how do they usually make the choice? I mean, how do they know what the menu is? Well, I don't have like a, a sheet or a menu yeah. to show them or anything. Just, so, 
yeah, I'll just walk up and I'll give them some suggestions of stuff that's popular, or like, you know, Disney stuff, because we're there, like Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and everything. Um, so I'll just give them a list of, of mm -hmm, probably mm -hmm. three to four things. And then they can choose one of those just to give them an idea. Or if they have like a favorite animal or something, I can usually yeah. make that. Yeah. Well, that, that, that sounds like you just say, do you have a favorite animal? And let them say what their favorite animal is. Okay. Yeah. That could work. Yeah, so you I mean, think it'd be, it'd be best not to even throw suggestions out? Hmm. Well, I, if the kid hesitates, you might throw out some options just to help them decide. Help but, them go, right. but, but again, give them a range. Give them a range of things instead of, oh, this is a girl. Would you like a unicorn or a cat? Right. <laughs> but you wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't do that. Well, I'm changing, Joe. I'm really, I'm willing to change. You know, that's what I, mean, I, I don't was... know you, but. <laughs> Well, honestly, I just, you know, I haven't given it much thought. You know, when I was trained a few years ago, that's what we were, what I was told to do was have a list for the boys and a list for the girls. So, you know, that's just how I was taught to do it. But I, and like I said, I haven't given much thought to it. But now with this, I'm, I'll, I'll change it up a bit. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are a lot it, of little girls out there who love dinosaurs. Yes, that's very true. I mean, and I, I do that stuff that does happen all the time, but sure, yeah, yeah. I don't want to contribute one or the one way or the other you know yeah I'm nice tasted you. beer by the way oh yeah one <laughs> the other yes, yes. <laughs> good stuff hard to yeah. get but when you can get it it's delicious yeah i i guess the thing is that we're, we're a little bit more comfortable sometimes with giving girls the the rocket or dinosaur option than we are giving the boys the unicorn option you know yeah, that's probably true, I guess. But see, that's going all the way back to why did they start putting little boys in pants instead of dresses? Oh, why is that? Because they wanted to avoid homosexuality. Oh, well, okay. Right, right. And and a little boy who is gay or who is a sissy or is in any way effeminate is in much greater danger <laughs> than a little girl who likes boy things. Okay. Right? Yeah, so, like a tom girl. Yeah, tomboy. Yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. So there, there, there is a, a kind of path that's worn for girls of, yeah, you, you do the girl thing. But if you don't like to do the girl thing, that's fine because you can be a scientist. You can do this. You can do that. Girls are powerful. Girls can do all these things. Whereas boys, that same path has like electrified fences on either side of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well said. And yeah. And 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 pink is part of what alerts them to that electrified fence you mm -hmm. color something pig and it's pink and that's like this is not not for not for boys not for you mm -hmm. stay away don't touch right see so for girls that that the nice wide path that doesn't really have any barriers because you're pretty you can do, <laughs> just keep going you're fine but the boy it's like this it, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So how can we, is there something we can do to kind of get more like gender neutral stuff or like get the baby section going? Is it just, you know, yeah. if, if we start, if, you know, in general, if everyone starts buying more of the, you know, stuff that's just for babies, then manufacturers will start producing more of that because that's what's selling. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's easy to make anything. Yeah. What what's hard is getting people to see it in a different way. I mean, I look back at uh, I do a lot of my research with Sears catalogs, mm -hmm. and if you look at a Sears catalog from the 1950s or even the early 1960s, you look into for the elementary school age kids, like the four to eight size range, they they'll have a couple of pages of play clothes, and they're clothes for both boys and girls, and they are the same. They're mm -hmm. not the boy play clothes and the girl play clothes. They're jeans and t-shirts and corduroy pants and little denim jackets and turtleneck shirts and all in like solid colors and stripes and things like that. Right. Now those those clothes 60 years ago, people looked at and saw kid clothes. Mm -hmm. Those clothes today people look at and see boy clothes. So what used to be perceived as neutral now is gendered, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way that the white dresses were baby clothes, and now 
someone will look at that and say, well, that's a little girl baby because she's wearing a dress. Right. So some of it is the clothing, you know, having those clothes again, those same options. But the other thing is people need to start seeing things as not gendered when mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily gendered. What genders them is is culture, not design. Right. Yeah. And culture is kind of shaping your 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 perception. Yeah. So to look at something, it's funny because I just I just watched the first episode of the new season of Queer Eye, uh -huh. one of my favorite shows. And they go into this whole thing because at this time, this episode, they're dressing, they're redoing a woman. And she's talking about wanting to be more feminine. And they're talking about, well, what is exactly feminine? And turns out they're they're on the same wave, same wavelength I am, where I'm starting to avoid the term feminine and masculine because mm -hmm. I think they're kind of lazy words. They really don't describe something directly. It's like it's a signifier for something else. So you say, oh, her clothing was very feminine. Well, what does that mean? What do you picture? What does uh, do you mean it was sexy, low cut, slinky fabric? Does that mean it was ruffles and lace and flowers? Does that mean so it describes nothing? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It just stands in for so appropriate to a female or something like that. So right. I'm not sure when it even makes sense to use those words. <laughs> no, and yeah. I realize that's kind of a strange thing to say, but I've, I've been talking to friends of mine who are fashion writers and people like that. And they'll talk about, well, I'm, I'm working on this, this style of I'm do, redoing a room for somebody and they want something very masculine. I said, what does that mean? Why are right. you using the word masculine? Do you, do they want dark colors? Do they want lots of wood? Are we talking wood leather? Are we talking animal heads? What are we talking about? What's masculine? Yeah. Uh, and what does it do when you call something masculine? Does that, again, set up for women? Think back to my, my metaphor of the paths, right? For women saying something is masculine, it's like, ooh, that could be trendy. Everything's masculine. This I'm going to get bigger, bigger shoulder pads. I'm going to get a short haircut. I'm masculine good because it's in style right now. I can carry that off. And masculine on a woman is sexy. If you call something feminine, what does that do? There's you got the electric fence. Yeah. Right. Of feminine. Oh, I can't do that. Right. <laughs> so I, it, it just it seems to me that what we really want people to be able to do is make their own decisions and have other people let them, as long as those decisions harm no one. Yeah. Respect those decisions. Sounds and, good to me, yeah. And the manufacturers will just have to figure it out. We're living in a very interesting era in terms of economics. People can make and buy anything. So yeah. why, should, why should there be so much sameness? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. We should have there, like lots and lots of variety. We should have as many different styles of baby clothes as we do brands of cereal in my cereal aisle at the grocery store. Yeah. It's dizzying, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. A cereal, you got lots of choices. Nobody says this is the cereal for girls. Yeah, that's <laughs> you true. You can't have that cereal. It's, it's girly. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's cereal. Lots and lots of brands. Yeah. If you go to the store. And all of a sudden, it's like, Whoop. yeah, very true. And it could, yeah, it could totally happen. We could have. There's so much more options and choices available, um, just because stuff is available on the internet. A store doesn't have to stock every single thing. You know, you can have stuff shipped to you that way. Yeah, and, and you can have things that are made for you. I mean, yeah. the best example of this is not necessarily like clothing, because bodies are complicated to fit all shapes and sizes and all this how about feet mm -hmm. think about feet masculine feet and feminine feet no feet <laughs> they're feet yeah they have five toes they have a certain shape they have different dimensions but they don't have boobs i mean you can paint your toenails i suppose and that would make it feminine or masculine maybe yeah, but, but why can't you just say, I would like, 
I'd like a brown pair of sneakers. Right. Brown sneakers. If I go to the women's side of the store, can you imagine how many brown sneakers I can find? Okay. <laughs> Not many. Yeah. But you should be, there should be some enterprising person out there who can just have me measure my foot, send them the measurements, and I say, I want a brown sneaker. Mm -hmm. Give me a brown sneaker that's sized for Joe. Right. I want a woman's brown sneaker. I don't know what that means. So there are some clothing items that the technology is there right now to do that. Mm -hmm. Make it so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, well, I think you cut it for just a second. What was that last thing you said? Make it so. <laughs> oh, make it so. Yes. Make it so. Yeah. Well, and this kind of leads to, you also wrote another book called Sex and Unisex. Yes. And that was all about kind of having just a, a unisex style, right? That was more... a well, it was looking at exactly what is unisex, because oh, okay. for the, this one, it was interesting because it was kind of the shavings left over from the pink and blue book. The pink and blue book is all about baby and toddler clothing. But mm -hmm. when I wrote about non-sexist child rearing in the unisex era, which is like the middle 60s through the early 80s, I ended up with so much stuff left over that wasn't baby or toddler that I said, and this is a fascinating period. I need to do a book about the unisex era and what, how people all of a sudden got very focused on ungendered child rearing and questioning sex roles and sexuality as a result of the women's liberation movement and um, civil rights and the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what the book is. So there's a chapter on kids' clothes, a chapter on women, a chapter on what happens with men's clothing, a whole chapter on um, dress codes and litigation because <laughs> there are lots and lots of legal cases about whether or not women could wear pants and even more about whether or not men could have long hair. Um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was – and then – by the time you get to the mid 80s, it's like, OK, it's all over. And now women are going to be women are going to be women again and girls are going to wear pink and blah, 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 blah. So it's like there's this defined era of the unisex style from around 1964 to the mid 1980s. So that's what that book is about. It's like what happened and what does it say about us today? And, yeah. you know. I started realizing having that I was in my my 20s when all that was happening It basically spans my years from high school to as a young professional and just having kids. Um, it just seemed like all of a sudden, say, within the last 10, 15 years, we we're having the same arguments all over again, that all of a sudden we're, we're here we are we're talking about gender again we're talking about whether or not women's you know women should have the right to choose we are talking about birth control for heaven's sakes all the stuff that we thought was settled back in the early 1970s it was back mm -hmm. so i thought okay clearly there was a conversation that started back in the early 60s that at some point people either got tired of or thought had been settled and we walked away and did other things. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's back again. We're, I mean, we're talking about gender more today than I remember it being in a conversation in like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of unfinished business. And that's so I figured at the very least, I'm a historian. So my, my immediate reaction when something comes up is let's go back and see where we, where we left off with this or where this right. came from, because otherwise we're just arguing with not enough information. Mm -hmm. We're thinking something has always been some way or whatever. So okay. I figure the historian's job is to say, okay, this is, this is what happened before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is where this came from. Yeah. So you think we're kind of we're kind of repeating ourselves from what had previously happened in the sixties? Yeah, yeah. We're kind it's, of there it, again. Yeah, okay. I remember when I said uh, something about what people what they believe about gender might be what they learned in psychology one hundred and one. Mm -hmm. 
like freshman year of college. Well, if if somebody went to college in the early, in the 1970s, probably most of the, most of the 80s as well, what they learned about je- sex and gender was you may have heard this because it's I think it's still floating around out there. Sex is biology, gender is culture. Okay, there are these two different uh, yeah. things and they're not connected. You have to you can't say gender when you mean sex because they're not the same thing. They're these two separate things. Well, that's what people were being taught at that time. <laughs> now, if you go back to the early child psychologists, they're saying, oh, sex and gender, they're very closely related. You you have to you have to teach gender mm-hmm. because Otherwise, kids will learn it wrong. And and because they learn their gender wrong, then they'll do sex wrong. Oh, okay. okay. I see. So, yeah, I know it's getting confusing. I know. But um, now, if you look at, like, current writing about gender and gender theory, queer theory, people are starting to say, well, you know, sex is cultural, too. Mm-hmm. So the way that we define whether some a baby is a man or, or is male or female is based only on externalities. And we know scientifically that that's not all there is to biological sex, that there are, in fact, more than two sexes. Mm-hmm. So the minute you start saying, no, we're going to just reduce sex to male and female, that's a cultural decision. OK. Right. Yeah. And all the expectations that come to that of this baby is female and then the fact that they interact with the baby a certain way or whatever, because they're female. Right. That's yes, that's cultural. But in fact, uh, people who study infant neuroscience know that being treated differently, being treated like a female actually does start affecting the child as well. Mm hmm. That the, the way they interact with people, the way they learn to talk, the way everything they do, it's, it's, it is actually shaping their physical brains. Yeah. So sex and gender are not these two separate things. They are connected in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Mm-hmm. And they're not binary. Right. <laughs> Uh, which is the other problem is the minute you start saying, well, and, and at the on the Queer Eye episode, I just saw one of the, the, the guys said something like, well, you know, masculine and feminine, they're like either ends of a spectrum. And I'm like, that's a useful idea, but still not quite right, because okay. it's still a binary. You're still saying they're opposites. There's feminine over here and there's masculine over here and then there's like shades of gray in the middle and again what we're learning about this is it's much more complicated than that Uh uh-huh much more complicated yeah um and then our attempt to put these labels on things can be comfortable and supportive for people for whom those labels are salient where you're sitting there saying yeah pink girly Feminine. I'm so with that. That's, you know, I never even have to think about it. Um, but then there are people who are sitting there saying feminine. Well, I'm, I think of myself as a woman, but that feminine thing you're talking about, that's not me. So does that mean I'm not a woman either? Or I'm a different kind of woman? Or I'm not quite a woman? Or I'm, does, is someone who's feminine more of a woman than I am? Mm-hmm. So there are a whole lot that these are all the unanswered questions. Yeah. That, we weren't dealing with 50 years ago. Right. Okay. So I, so do you think maybe this, like the more research that's being done today and stuff and maybe new research techniques and and stuff like that is going to help where maybe back in the, you know, in the eighties when we kind of just, you know, gave up on it or whatever, just kind of did our other stuff. Um, now that it's kind of come back, do you think the advances in the research and new stuff coming up might uh, help it progress forward even more than it did back then? It might. I mean, I, I think that's part of how progress happens to the extent uh-huh. that progress happens in, in human culture is um, it, it, there's there's this great concept in, in ecology that I actually like is uh, punctuated equilibrium. Uh-huh. Doesn't that sound great? Historians historians never come up with terms like that. Punctuated equilibrium. It's the idea. It used to be people thought of evolution as happening 
like on the steady state, just progress slowly, 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 slowly. And then the more they studied evolution in all kinds of insects and plants and animals, they said, no, what happens is you have a period of some kind of stress or something that happens, a big change that happens, and the organism kind of adapts to that. But that takes a lot of energy. And then you have this period of equilibrium after a while where they kind of settle into that. And so it is kind of this, like, like you, you stretch something and then you have to let it rest and then you can mm -hmm. stretch it some more. So it's like that. So you're not going to have this steady thing of every day and every way we're getting better and better. You're going to mm -hmm. have these periods every once in a while of, of, kind of heightened interest in something, a lot of energy put in into it, a lot of attempts to make change, some successful, some unsuccessful. I mean, like, for example, um, back in the 1970s, uh, it became perfectly okay for men to, to go and get their hair styled instead of just going to a barbershop. Mm -hmm. That's no big deal anymore. Right. Uh, women wearing pants, really no big deal. So there are some things that just at, at this point, it's just kind of, was it ever different? You know, people just think of this as normal. But uh, if you look at, well, you spend any time looking at fashions of the 70s, you see there are a lot of things that didn't stick around. Yeah. <laughs> that Especially for men. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I think women came off better from the, the, the gender bending of the 70s than the men did. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, because when you come right down to it, I don't know about your climate, but where I live, and it gets hot and sticky in the summertime, a long flowy skirt or dress is a much better choice. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. feel sorry for all those guys walking around in their suits because they feel like they have to wear suits. Yep. I have said that before. I would love to wear a dress on, on some summer days here. They're nice. They're really yeah. comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe, maybe this time around. I don't know. But right. yeah, but there is that feeling of right now we're in this kind of lots and lots of energy put it into this. Everything is not going to change, but some mm -hmm. things will. Right. And then I'll write about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, people ask go. me, well, I get asked to predict things and I always I, well, I'm a, I'm a historian. I write about stuff after it happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's important because like, you know, I had always, you know, thought about this stuff a bit and seen it and everything, but not till you really learn about the history of it and think about it, of how it affects us today and everything. Do you really start to really understand and, and think about how just the little choices that I make every day are like, why do I even, why do I do certain things? So it's fun to think about. And I think that learning about it definitely helps change things too for the better, hopefully. Yeah. Well, I think that's true of anything. I think that's why history is important. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of what's going on now in terms of social justice history that people are writing and people really wanting to know more about what happened 150 years ago, 100 years ago in terms of race relations. That's important stuff because it, it's not something that is generally known. Mm -hmm. And knowing these things and having a better understanding of how we got where we are today is always going to help you with those itty bitty little decisions where all of a sudden you're standing in a store. Do I get this or do that? Making mm -hmm. other types of decisions, you know, that might just be made automatically up to that point. And yeah. anytime you anytime you think more about life, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to think. I, yes, I, I think it's good to pay attention to things. Yes. Yeah, very true. Um, so you are working on a new book. It's not released yet, is it? But it, you're you're working on it, right? <laughs> uh, this is where I put the bag over my head. I'm still working on it. It's yes. it's it's been morphing as these things do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you have to picture at one point. Once I got started to write sex and unisex, I got this brilliant idea of oh, it's going to be a trilogy because you got pink and blue, and that's baby and toddler clothing and that kind of establishes that gender distinctions have this history and where pink and blue came from and how we define what ma what's masculine and feminine mm -hmm. then i look at everybody's clothing in the 60s and 70s so it's looking at all ages 
but for a defined period. And then I said, and then what I want to do next is looking at clothing at the other end of the age spectrum and looked at clothing for women over 50 and the history of that. Well, it's turned out to be less of a history and more of a kind of generational autobiography mm-hmm. where what I'm looking at is very, very narrowly looking at women who are exactly my my age, like either born in 1949 or I call them the class of 1967. Uh, specifically white women, because I think that part of what we were learning was not only how to be female, but also how to be white, white ladies, white okay. girls, like white, where white ladies come from. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been interviewing people and I've got a little Facebook group that's a class of 1967 that I have, I ask them questions and we share pictures and things like that. Of, so it's not just about my memories. Um, which are limited to certain geographical areas. Uh, but also, it's an interesting generation for me because you get that that sweet spot of people who, women who graduated in 1967 from high school probably did not wear pants to school, except on special, we're, we're going to let you wear pants today. But by the, t- but the ones who graduated like the next year and the next year are much more likely that the, like, the dress codes changed across the country in the late 60s. Oh, okay. And then by the time we got out of college, four years later, the workplace is starting to change. So we were also like the first ones to go into the workplace and be wearing some kind of pantsuits or things like that. When mm-hmm. we started having kids, we were the first ones that have uh, professional maternity wear. So there are all kinds of things that kind of happen along that timeline that we were mm-hmm. We were the market for because it's the leading the edge of the baby boom. It's just when the the market the, the marketers started paying attention to us of, oh, well, there's this bulge in the population that is now reaching this point in their lives, and now they want to do this. Right. And um, so um, kind of taking a look at how this particular group encountered changes in what was defined as feminine and female. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, because it did change along with, along the lines. I mean, if you have to use your imagination here, and I know this is a stretch because you're both a whole lot younger than I am and you're a guy. But if you could imagine growing up as a child with Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, like curvy, curvy women, these are real women, this is what you aspire to. And then 16 years old, we have Twiggy. Yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it's like, and it's not like you can run out and get a new body. Yeah. By that time, puberty has happened. You have what you have. <laughs> and they've just changed. They've just changed the rules. They've just changed. No. And and then by the 70s, it's Farrah Fawcett. It's like athletic, you know. Mm-hmm. Not, you, you, it, just in the time before we turn 30, it's, okay, you're going to be the hourglass figure and very sexy mm-hmm. to you're going to look like an adolescent boy right. to you're going to look like you've been, you go to the gym five days a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And now of course we're all turning 70 and going, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now what? <laughs> and look what you've and, and look what nature has done to me. You are what you are. We're all right. going to turn into little old men. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man well joe this is really fun talking to you honestly i I really enjoyed it and you know i feel like i learned a lot this is really really great thank you yeah i just wish i could learn how to make balloon animals but oh yeah (laughs) i got some videos on youtube i'll I'll send you some great 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 um so all your books are on well the first two are on amazon right yeah yeah. Okay, I'll put links to those. Um, if, they to, if, if they are a member of the white females class in 1967, if they go to my uh, the Gender Mystique blog mm-hmm. uh, and send me a, a contact thing, if they're on Facebook, I can add them to the Facebook group and they can join join the research process. Okay. Yeah, you know, great. I'll, I'll definitely throw a link to that so people can, can join in and help you out and stuff. Um, anything else? And a website or anything? Uh, my my main website uh, is jbpaoletti.com. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that's got the boring information about me and the blog that's everything else. It's literally called everything else because gender mystique is all that's where I write about the, my ongoing research and anything has to do with gender. But now that I'm trying to write more and I'm writing about other things, there's everything else. I, In my spare time, I watch Indian movies like mm-hmm. a crazy woman. So I <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is good. Cool. Well, yeah, I'll throw links to all that stuff. We'll check it all out. And um, yeah, really, really do appreciate it. It was uh, fun talking to you, Joe. It was fun talking to you too, Travis. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, yes, you too. Enjoy the rest of the day and have a good one. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.